it's a mineral, that is absolutely correct. Who knows the chemical compound for salt? From our old chemistry, what are the mark? NaCl, sodium chloride, right? So it's a, com it's a compound mineral with sodium chloride put together. What else is salt? Like a it can be. Salt is a, usually it's a geometric square that's flat on one side at least, and you can do all kinds of neat tricks with salt. You can pour some salt out on a table in a restaurant, and you can balance the salt shaker on it, because salt has level flat pieces on it. Just for your information, if you want to try that way in a restaurant somewhere, <laughs> and you're waiting on your food, <laughs> you can... You can balance a salt shaker on pieces of salt because of that. So what else does salt do? It enhances. It enhances things, doesn't it? I like to have salt in my food. If you've ever eaten food that doesn't have enough salt in it, you realize the flavor just really isn't there. Debbie and I struggle with that, trying to figure out what's the right amount of salt that we should have. I don't cook with much, or she doesn't cook with much. I cook with more. I like salt because it does enhance your flavor. Who would eat a baked potato without salt on it? I mean, just to eat it. Well, you're worried about it. Well, she may be worried as well. But we like salt. It does enhance flavor. What else does salt do? Preserves. It preserves things. And we don't think much about that today because most of us aren't making stuff, our own food, doing things with it to need salt to preserve. But in Jesus' time, when Jesus gives this parable about salt, Preservation was one of the main things they did with it. And in some of the articles I read, they, they made all kinds of stuff. They preserved all kinds of food with salt. Uh, you cure ham, you cure bacon, you cure all kinds of things with salt. A lot of oriental foods have a lot of salt in them. Soy sauce has a lot of salt. Haley loves soy sauce, and she'll dump almost a whole bottle on her cup of rice. Uh, and we keep telling us way too much salt. It, it's got a lot of salt in it. Kimchi is another dish. Oh. Lots of salt in kimchi. A lot of foods we eat have a lot of salt in them. I like salt and butter on my popcorn. So what's the point of having popcorn if you don't have salt on it? So we think of our butter. Again, we don't think as much about salt. For us, salt is simply a seasoning kind of thing that you cook with. But it, as Don said, in the days of Jesus, salt did all kinds of things. It changes the flavor and it preserves. So we've got both of those answers. Uh, that were the answer there to slide number six. That's what salt does. It did it then. It does it today. And in a lot of foreign countries, salt is still used. We're on page two, I think, when Rosalind of this hanged up. People still use salt, but we don't use it very much anymore. Tofu, something I don't think I've ever eaten, has a lot of salt in it. When we don't use salt the way we're supposed to, things become less vibrant. It doesn't reach their full potential. It's one of those things that enhances things, as Alvis said. There was a, a phrase in Latin that you've got there in your handout is salarium argentum. Argentum is really a word that, from which we get the word silver. Salt comes from salarium. That's the salt word in the old Latin. And they saw salt as so valuable, they considered it as valuable as silver. Can you see that, Alice? Yeah. And so to them, salt was extremely important. Salarium is where the word salad comes from. That's exactly correct. And that's one of your blanks right there. It was salt money. There's a little bit of challenge in history whether the Roman soldiers were actually paid in salt, but some were seems like others were given specific allowances so they could go buy their salt because salt was such a vital commodity to not only the men but the animals you know if you know much about animals there's salt licks they have that animals need to go lick if they don't have a good enough diet uh, the word salary as Rob's already told us that's where that comes from the Roman hierarchy would pay some of their soldiers and others in a salt and that's where that word comes from into English recognizing salt was so valuable and that it was used as currency in some times. Uh, we have a little phrase we say, it's worth his salt. You ever said that? Heard somebody say that? That's where this comes from. Salt was so valuable that you've talked about it all the time. Uh, 
purple dye, which the Caesars used to make their robes, was made by dropping mollusk into a vat of heavy salt water, and the purple dye would leach out of that. And so when Julius Caesar realized that, they conquered the Phoenician people. Uh, he didn't let anybody wear purple, but the emperor his family because it was so difficult to make, so royal to make, that he didn't allow people to use it for any other purpose. So as we think about salt in the days of Jesus, it's probably much more valuable to them than we would think about today. What do you throw over your shoulder for good luck? Salt. A pinch of salt, right? We all know that. You throw it over, if you break something, or throw it over your shoulder. Uh, all kinds of weird things we do with salt. Jesus says... If the salt loses its saltiness, what's it good for? Yeah. No, it's nothing. Throw it away and walk on it. Make it road pavement or something. Uh, what does that mean to you, when Jesus says that? Yeah. What do you think that means when Jesus says if it's lost its saltiness, it's worth just throwing it away? Saltiness is a different between the two. Blending and it to whatever's there. Okay, all right. It does. But what good is it if we've thrown it away? No good. It's trash. It's garbage. So here's Jesus giving us these parable stories, or the Beatitude stories. Here's who you are if you're a good follower of God. <coughs> Blessed are you if you do these things. The very next thing he says is this thing about salt. What do you think he's talking about? They've lost their salt in this, haven't they? We as followers of God are to act like salt. We're to enhance things. We're to preserve things. We have great value in the days of Jesus, much more so. Again, we have that little phrase, worth of salt. Most people probably don't have a clue of what that means and why we say that. But now you all do. And so Jesus is saying, if you're going to be a follower of God, if you're going to be blessed by doing all these things, then you need to do what you're designed to do. And if you're the salt of the earth, your job is to enhance the world, it's to preserve the world, it's to make the world a better place. And if you're not doing that, Jesus says, you might as well be thrown out uh, and cast underfoot. That's a scary little thought, because the idea I think Jesus is saying is that a follower of his, today we're Christians, but in the days of Jesus, the Jews, the people he's talking to, if you're not doing what God's designed you to do, that's what you're worth. You ever thought about it that way? Mm -hmm. That God would say, you know, if you're not going to fulfill your role as salt, if you're not going to be instrumental in a changing environment, preserving things that are valuable, enhancing the value of others, you have no value to me. I'm going to just throw you out, which is a scary thought. Yeah, Jesus is saying that's what we're worth. If we won't use the gifts he's given us, if we're not going to do the things we're supposed to do, that's the value we have to Jesus. That doesn't sound too good to me. Uh, but I think we need to pay attention to the, that little verse. It's a very important thing. First thing Jesus says once he gets out of the Beatitudes is this is us. We are to be salt. We're to change the world. We're to preserve the world. We're to be the kind of people that are easily seen. We influence people. All that kind of stuff, all the stuff we talked about, salt being, that's what Jesus is saying, I think. And if you're not going to do that, then you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. All these beatitudes that we go through, all the blessed are you if you do all this stuff, that's not you. You don't get that because you're not doing those things. You're not living the way God wants us to live. I don't know why the list that I got left this little verse out of the list of beatitudes. I think that's a powerful beatitude to encourage us to be the people we're supposed to be. Then we get to the light ones. Those are the ones that are on the list that we gave you to get this class started. We come to those. Anybody in a, bit of a dark place that is so dark you can't see your hand in front of your face? Scary spot, isn't it? We used to go to Carl's Dad Caverns in New Mexico. Back in the old days, y'all been there in the old days where you went with a tour guide and you're in a little group of people, they don't do that anymore because now you get a little micro or a little radio and you go out around self-guiding. They don't dare turn the lights off without people falling hundreds of feet over the edge of the stuff because you can't see. 
But every once in a while, they would make everybody stop, and the tour guides would get everybody in a close little group. They'd say, hang on to the rail, hang on to somebody next to you, and don't be standing out somewhere unsupported, and then they'd turn the lights out. I've never been in such a dark place. I mean, you literally can't see a thing. You can put your fake hand right there, and it's just so pitch black. It's just, it's scary, and you can lose your sense of equilibrium real quick because you don't have a clue where anything is, anybody is. And then when I was there as a child, way off in the corner somewhere, somebody turned on the light. And you could just imagine you're in this pitch back black place. And it's all the way across the cavern. And somebody just turns on a little light. And you can see that everywhere. The light made such an impact in that darkness. Uh, but things like that, when you think about light, we talk about these parables we're going to get into Imagine we live in a world of darkness if God isn't in it, right? The whole world is dark. It has no light. Jesus will say many times, I'm the light. And he's given us the idea that he's the person that's going to illuminate this world in which we live. He's going to bring light out of darkness. But without that light, we all just stumble around in the dark. And you can't see a thing. I mean, I, we keep a light, night light on in our house, in our bathroom, right off our bedroom. So we got animals laying all over the floor, and I don't want to trip over them when I get up in the middle of the night to go, you know where. Uh, but it's always nice to have a light. It's great to have light. And so when we imagine these parables about light, we can easily identify with being in the black and wanting a light. I mean, I've got a flashlight that I almost hit the moon from my house. I, I mean, it's a bright flashlight. I love those flashlights. You can see everywhere. You blind pilots with them. I know, all kinds of fun stuff. Air Force don't like them. Um, <laughs> but we're going to look at these. We're going to go through the three that we've got, and, and actually four, uh, and talk about what they are. He talks about a city set on a hill. In fact, let's go back and read those real quick. We didn't read these because we weren't getting into them until the salt was over. I'm going to read the Mark and Luke ones together, and then we'll read the second Luke one later because it's a little different. Mark 4, 21. It says, Do you bring in a light or a lamp to put it under a bowl or, or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on a stand? And whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed, and whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. If anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. Consider carefully what you hear, he continued. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you and even more. Whoever has will be given more, and whoever does not have even what they have will be taken from them. Then Luke 8 says, verse 16, No one lights a lamp and hides it in a clay jar or puts it under a bed. Instead, they put it on a stand so that those who come in can see the light. For there is nothing hidden that will not be disclosed and nothing concealed that will not be known or brought into the open. Therefore, consider carefully how you listen. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they think they have will be taken from them. And then in the Matthew account, we've read already, Jesus says it's like a city set on a hill. What is a city set on a hill? It's a point of reference. Yeah, many times that is absolutely correct. You're trying to get somewhere, and again, this probably doesn't apply to us much anymore. But we've got GPS and all kinds of stuff, street signs and whatnot. <laughs> but if, you've got, if you're traveling in the old days and you can see a city set up on a hill, people know where it's at. You can be found. It's easily seen. It is a point of reference, and you know if I'm headed toward that direction, there is the light way up there on the top of the hill. That's what I'm going for. And most of us, if we've traveled much across the country or something, and you went back and forth in a well-known pattern, you knew when you got to a certain spot, you were almost home, didn't you? You looked for that spot. You realized, there it is. You know, I'm just half a mile from my house, you know, or whatever. That's what I think Jesus is trying to say with the city on a hill. It's easily seen. It's easily found. It's a great reference point. You know where you're at in relation to that point that you're looking for. It will guide you to it. It will guide you to it. People looking for it can find it. You know, that's the idea. Whether you're the enemy and you're going to attack it, or you're a friend and you're trying to just get home, you can find it easily because it's setting up on a hill. I never was in a war zone as far as lights having to be put out. We didn't worry about that in Vietnam, but you read the stories of England 
in places during the Blitzkrieg and the German bombings. Everybody you had curtains all over your windows and turned your lights out because you wanted it as dark as possible so the enemy bombers couldn't see where you were. And they made everybody turn them out. Just the opposite of this one. You've got a light on a hill, city on a hill, so people can find it. If you're being bombed by somebody, you want your lights out so you don't show up so well for somebody. We live, we live five miles out. In, in the dark, dark. yes, you do. And you can look on the other side of the hill, the other side of it, there's a little town. And you can see the light, the lightness in the sky on that way. You look, Johnson City, there's a big light. Yes. It lights up the sky so you know where you're headed. It gives you a direction that it lets you know which way you're supposed to be going. And if I turn around and it's all no lights on that side, I'm going to wonder what happens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Power outage. Uh, notice in Matthew 5, he doesn't do this in the other two, but in Matthew chapter 5, uh, Jesus gives us an, uh, an understanding of the parable. I always love it when Jesus explains the parables. Uh, and my suggestion is if Jesus tells us what this means and what we're supposed to learn from it, that's what it means, and that's what we're supposed to learn from it. Uh, don't go making up a bunch of other stuff. If Jesus has told us what it means, in the one in Matthew chapter 5, he does that. He says, in the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. What's the light that he's talking about there? Your actions. Yeah, I think so. The action, the, the salt that you are. Now, he's giving us the salt thing. Saying if it's lost, it's salted us, it's worth nothing, might as well throw it away. And then he goes into, and you're the light of the world. And so your light needs to shine. Your light needs to be seen by others. And here the message is, you do what you need to do where people can see you, so they are glorify your Father in heaven. That's why we do good things. That's why John gets us involved in all kinds of stuff. is so that hopefully we can be doing things out in our community, Letting Christ be seen through us. That's why when we do things like this, do the best you can to put your best foot forward. All right? Don't get mad at people. Uh, don't yell at them. Don't throw stuff at them. Uh, you know, be as nice as you can because we are representing Jesus Christ when we're out doing those things. And that's exactly what Jesus says here for this parable is do the things you're going to do so people can see them and glorify God. That makes sense? And I think that's sometimes a challenge for us. And, and other people around you. When I was in Michigan, the way I treated people, the way I acted, I had HR come to me to ask me to do a benediction at an award ceremony. And, and I, I had no idea why. And I actually went to them and said, why are you asking me to do this? And said, because we know you're a Christian. Yeah. And, it wasn't written down anywhere or nothing. It was just... It's the evidence you've produced from your lifestyle. And that's what they're talking about. Yeah, people saw you. People knew who you were. And see how you act. It's even when people come to ask you for prayers that have no relationship at all with Christ, yeah. but they come to you because they know you have one. Debbie always has people, when she's at ETSU, always say, you ever get your church to pray for me? Yeah, because they knew, like her example, she would do that in our church. We do it because she would ask us to do it. Yeah. That's the kind of example... All of us should be. And sometimes I can remember in one of my sermons ages ago telling a story about something I read somewhere uh, where this guy came up to the preacher and said, I just had a great week. I found out that one of my coworkers go to the same church we do. It's a large church. And we've been working together for five years, and we just found that out. And the preacher, instead of being excited for him, said, that's one of the sorriest things I've ever heard <laughs> And the guy says, what do you mean what I saw you saying? He says, You've been working in this factory with another Christian for five years and you didn't know it. You didn't go out to share your Christianity with people and have somebody say, well, I'm a Christian too. You know, and I think there's a good point to that little story. Do we let our light shine? Or do we put it under a bushel basket or hide it under the bed or do whatever the Bible says don't do with it? Rather than let people know we're Christian people. Or do we let it shine us on Sundays? Yeah. And and if didn't cover it's shining on Sundays, it's shining at all. Yeah. You know, that's the key, I think. God wants us doing things. So the answer is they point people to God. If we will do what we're supposed to do by our actions, by our language, and do it correctly, that light that we're showing to the world will point people to God. And that's what we need to be doing. Thoughts about that? Well, yesterday, uh, our family 
got out of verse 17, and I don't, I don't know if this is right, but this is how I read verse 17, is um, if, if you do something bad and are, are trying to hide it and not tell anybody, that you're, there's nothing that you can hide. He's going to know. You know God, God certainly knows. knows. That's what I'm saying. Yes, yes. So for there is nothing to hid that will not be disclosed, and he knows everything you do. Yes. You know, you can hide it with your wife, your whatever, but you can't. It's amazing how we think we can do that. Hide it from him. We think we can do things that God doesn't know. We, we do things we shouldn't be doing, and I don't know that we really think, well, God's not going to find out. It's just like we ignore the fact that God knows. You know, I do something without thinking about what I'm doing. God already knows what I'm doing. But I do it anyway, thinking, without thinking that God already knows. Not even thinking about God at all. That's exactly right. He's not even in our mind. Yeah, We're just doing what we want to do. Did come up for instance. You can't just stop. There is very well. If we would just pay attention to what's going on, we'd realize God doesn't want me doing this. And you know, I claim that verse in First Corinthians chapter ten, verse thirteen, that says, "For every temptation that comes, God will provide a way out." In other words, nothing is going to tempt you to sin, but that God will give you an opportunity not to. He will give you a way out. The thing God gives, we have to reach out and take. You've got to do it, which is like, it won't make you not sin. And many times I've looked back and said, boy, I could have avoided that. Instead, I did it anyway. But if you look back, there's always something that happened that could have prevented you from doing the sin that you just did. Because God's promise is, I will give you a way out if you'll just pay attention to me. And choose that way. We don't. He doesn't force us to choose, and that's the problem. Now, this goes right along with the statement that uh, the truth will always come out. That is exactly right. It doesn't matter if it comes out immediately or 15 years down. The yep. truth always comes out. It does. We like to think and you it can't does. hide anything. Yeah. So what's the so what's that the context? Right I read that. We're going to talk about that. Uh oh. First, what's the context? Anybody figured that out yet? He's just told the parable of the poor soil. That's exactly right. And we haven't covered that yet. I don't know. I guess it's because the Matthew account got before these. Uh, but we will cover that one soon. But that's what just has happened. This, the parable of the sower who goes out and throws the seed. And some falls on the path. Some on the rocky ground. Some on the thorny ground. Some on good ground. And the good ground produces crops. Some 30, some 60, some 100. Then he goes right into verse 21 of Mark 4. Then he says to them, do you bring a lamp to put it under a bowl or a bed? If that's the context, what's he saying? Which soil are you? That's exactly right. What kind of soil are you that the seed has fallen into? What is the seed? The word. The word. It's the word because he says that in a parable. <coughs> that's, that's the nice thing about it. We don't have to guess at that. What Jesus says in his explanation to his disciples, the word or the seed is the word. And then he closes up with, don't hide your light. Don't let the light that you've got, you disciples, because that's who he's talking to. Remember, they'd come to him and said, why do you talk in parables? And we covered this in the first night. Yeah. And he says to those who don't want to see, they're never going to get it. And so I talk in parables, but you guys, and then this is the one where he says, well, if you don't get it, are you going to get any of them? And he just seems like he's a little frustrated with these right here where they, they don't quite get it. And then he says, here's the explanation. And he gives the story. And then he says to them, do you bring a lamp and hide it under a bed or somewhere? And the Luke accounts the same. He's just given the parable of the sower in the Luke chapter 8 as well. So if we look at it that way, Jesus is saying to his disciples. Well, go ahead. there's also a crowd there. He's got a crowd forming. He does, but he isn't talking to the crowd here, I don't think. Because remember, he goes off with his disciples, and his disciples ask him, what's the meaning of this? Well, it's in 13. Well, and and yes. Luke 4, 8, 4, it says, well, a large crowd okay, is okay. gathering. Okay. But, I, mean, I, don't, I, don't, I mean, it could be. Yes. But his disciples are there as well. Yes. So he had just healed the, uh, Mary from the demon. Right. Uh, so I don't know if the crowd is still. His disciples are definitely there. But I, yeah, I guess his Luke 8 is probably the same setting as Mark 4. That there is a big crowd because he's just given the parable. Correct. And he's talking to the crowd with this parable. But it seems like he then goes off with his disciples privately and says, 
when they ask him what's the meaning of this, because he shares, some people aren't going to get it, Correct. Yeah. and others will get it. And then he tells them, and I think through them, us, because we've been shared these things, they've come to us, we've got the message. He says, you don't hide your light. You need to be out broadcasting this stuff. You need to share the gospel that I'm giving to you. You're going to get your chance to do that. Don't hide it. Don't refuse to tell people about the gospel. Tell them about me. Remember, there's a few passages in the, the gospels that always puzzles us and makes us scratch our head. When Jesus tells people, don't go tell anybody. Don't say anything to anybody. Because he was waiting on the right time. He's got a plan. God had a plan. He knew when the right time was going to be. And he even tells his disciples a few times that the close 12, don't say anything about this yet. Keep your mouth shut. That's heavy in John. Yes, he says the time's not come yet. Yes. And he's not prepared yet for the world to know what he's teaching them. But I think he's telling them here, you're going to be this light. When it's your time to spill it out, you got to do it right. You can't just hide the truth from everybody else. And again, Matthew specifically says we're talking about doing your good deeds. Do the things you do so people glorify God. We don't get that explanation in Mark and Luke, but I think it's the same general idea. We're supposed to be out letting our light shine. We don't hide the truth that we've got, the light of Jesus Christ, by keeping our mouth shut and not telling people about who Jesus is. We need to be doing what he's supposed to do, what he wants us to do. And then Moses thought, for whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed. Whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. If we look at the context, what's he saying? He's talking about the word. He's talking about what? The word. Okay. What, what's hidden? And how, how is it hidden? He just don't want to hear. That, and remember, he just said in the parable, the parable of the sower, some people aren't going to get it. Right. Some people aren't going to see it. They're not going to hear it. You guys are getting the truth. And what I'm telling you now, you're going to share it to the multitude. I'm not sure he's talking about sin there, Mo. I think he's talking about to his disciples, even though that's the way I've always heard it. Usually I, I hear it that way, and most preachers that I've heard preach it is, well, whatever you're doing in secret, it's going to come out. Everybody's going to know what we're doing. Like, like you asked him, like what Alva says, you can't hide your sin. But if we grab the context he's talking about, He's just ended this parable of the sower by talking about the good seed and what it's supposed to do. And then he's told them, you don't take this light that I'm sharing with you and hide it. Instead, it needs to be broadcast. And he's just told them, not everybody's going to get it right then and there. I'm speaking in parables, but ultimately it's going to be revealed. He also warned them that Satan comes and takes away the word. He does. Yeah. And that's what we end up letting happen. We let the cares of the world get us, and we'll get into that terrible in another week or two probably, but I think we need that context to pull these out, that Jesus is talking about the Word of God. You don't, don't hide his Word, you put it on the stand. And the stuff he's telling his disciples in secret right now, the things he's concealing with them, are going to come out. The message is going to get out. There is a time coming when you are going to go into all the world and be my witnesses, right? That's what he tells them when you get ready to die. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. In other words, when the time comes, all this stuff that's hidden, all this stuff people don't understand, that they haven't heard yet, is going to be revealed. I don't think he's talking about sin here. We call that in the context at all. It's the message. It's the light. It's the word. And he's telling his disciples, there's coming a time when you're going to share this word with everybody. All these things that are hidden, it's going to come. It's going to come out. So we need to share the word with others. That's the key, I think, Jesus is trying to point out to us, is our job is to let our light shine. Charles Spurgeon, who was a, an old preacher, he said it like this, and it's there in your handout, uh, I think. He says, the Bible is not the light of the world. It's the light of the church. The world does not read the Bible. You ever thought about that? <laughs> you know, that's like this apologetic study we're getting ready to start on Sunday mornings. If you don't believe the Bible is the Word of God, you really don't care what the Bible says. It doesn't mean anything to you. You've got to have some other way to bring people to Jesus. But Spurgeon said, the world doesn't read the Bible. The world reads Christians. You're the light of the world. That's bad. <laughs> yeah. I mean, isn't that, isn't that technically right? Because people that say they're Christians and 
claim to be Christian. Don't always do that. Okay. Spread the word. They, they don't, and they don't live the way none of us do. We don't, we don't live the way we should. And so the world looks at us. They read us hypocrites, hypocrites, and they say, "Boy, if that's what church going people are like, I don't need that. I can sleep in on Sunday and, and do the things you guys are doing." And so I think Jesus is trying to make this point to us that things are going to be revealed. You disciples of mine, you're getting it in secret. I'm sharing with you parables that the world doesn't get yet, but you're going to share it all. And when what's hidden will be revealed, the world will hear all this. They will know what's supposed to happen. You just need to be paying attention to it. So we need to be sharing the word. And that's the Spurgeon quote. I really like that quote. The Bible is not the light of the world. It's the light of the church. And we need to let that light shine through us because people are looking at us. People judge God by us. We touched already. Uh, this is the, the Luke account. We touched on it already, so we won't read that again. Uh, but he's talking to his disciples. And I think that's important for us to recognize. He isn't talking to the world. He's not talking to the crowds. He's talking to his disciples right here, telling them what they're supposed to do. Remember, he's just asked, uh, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? Uh, they're not getting it. So he says to them, talking to his disciples, talking to these 12 uh, that were his intimate buddies here. And then he says, if anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. Are you listening to me? Are you paying attention to what he's saying to them? Are you paying attention to me? Are you listening to what I'm telling you? Got your ears on? You ever said that to somebody? You know, you, are you listening to me? You know, tell, let's make sense what we're doing here. The purpose of the lamp. What's the purpose of the lamp? For a light. Yeah, to turn on light so others can see. And that's what Jesus is saying to those disciples and through them to us. You've got to show God's message. You've got to let people see God in you. Your light has to reflect God's light so that other people will come to know what I am, who I am. And what they need to know. God does not want us hiding our light under our bed, under a bushel basket, uh, whatever. What's that little song we used to sing? This little light of mine, light of mine I'm going to let it shine. Right? We all sang that growing up. John, did you sing that growing up? I did. Yeah. Huh? What's that second verse? Hide it under our bushel. No! I'm going to let it shine. What do we not let Satan do? Come on out. No, poof it out. Right? Don't let Satan it out. That's a great little song that we need to think about once in a while. That's exactly what these parables are trying to tell us. Have you seen Sunday? We had Daniel sing it, yeah. <laughs> That's the message of that little song that we all sang when we were little kids, probably having no clue what we were singing. It's these parables right here. Let your light shine so the world sees you. Don't hide it under a bushel basket. Don't let Satan poof it out. You do what you're supposed to do. Be the kind of person that shines the light so others can see Jesus, so they can get to him where they need to go. So I think the parable of the lamp tells us we have an obligation. Jesus says, let your good deeds shine so others can see them and grow up by God. The implication of Mark and Luke's accounts is the same. You need to let your light shine. You need to let people see you. You need to get the message out there. You need to be telling people there's a way to God, and it's through Jesus Christ. And if you'll do that, then we will complete what you're supposed to be doing. And when you do the right things, don't take credit. Yeah, give God the, the glory. glory. Give yeah. God the glory. And that's the whole point of it. You know, if you're doing something good for somebody, you let them know somewhere in your conversation, you know, I'm doing this because God loves me and he loves you, and this just seems like the right thing to do. It's not, well, you know, I'm just a nice guy. You know, I'm a little Jack Horner. And I'm going to pull out my plum and I'm going to say, what a good boy am I? You know, that isn't the way we're supposed to be doing our good deeds. We give God the glory. Okay? We need to do it. And that, remember there's that other verse, I think, in Matthew, in Matthew 7. It talks about don't let your left hand know what your right hand doing. Uh, hide these things, things you do in secret. God will reveal in public. And, and if you have people say, read that verse say, well, you're never supposed to let anybody know anything that you do. Don't ever let anybody know because you can't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. What's the problem with that understanding versus this understanding? That since those people should see what you're doing. Yes. And the other one 
is don't brag about it. That's exactly right. You got to get the context, right? The context, the people will pull that passage and they'll pull this passage and say, if they don't believe the Bible, look at this conflict. In this passage, Jesus says, don't let your left hand know what you're doing. In this passage, it says, you're like a city on a hill. Tell everybody so God knows what's up. You got to get the context right. Yeah, the other one is people who are bragging about what they're doing. Boasting. Yeah, boasting. The Pharisees on the hip, on the side of the road who drop something in the mud and say, I'm not giving something today. Yeah, totally different context from and this. Standing and praying on the corner so they're both. Yes, yes, exactly right. So they think they're getting the credit. They're getting bolstered up. They're getting the brag about, I'm such a good, good guy. God's already said they know. Yes. You got to get the context. You got to make sure you know what you're talking about. So as a lamp, if you're the lamp, you reveal some things that are hidden. Notice Jesus says, for whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed. Whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. What's hidden? Who he is. That's it. Who Jesus is. Who Jesus is. The message he's trying to give us. It's the kingdom that we're supposed to be. What's the hidden light? The first is the kingdom of God. Don't hide the kingdom of God. Don't conceal it. Share the message that you've got. Know that there are people out there hungering and thirsting for something more in their life. And we've got the answer. Don't hide it. Don't be a secret. What's it, what does it mean by he uses the word secret and the mystery? Remember, Paul uses that word mystery a lot in his writings. The mystery Paul's talking about is what? Gentiles coming in. The Gentiles coming in. No longer just the Jews being God's chosen people. God's revealed this mystery. And we use that word mystery, we think, well, that's like a puzzle. In a sense, that word also means a truth that's being revealed. <laughs> and so depending upon how you translate that word, Paul is writing, saying, there is a truth of God that's now being revealed to you, that the Gentiles are going to be accepted into God's kingdom. He uses the word mystery, and a lot of translations use the word mystery. The second one, I think, is Moe's thought, and that is, the light brings to light the sins of people. But I don't think he's talking to us that these things are concealed and they're going to come out. But I think when we teach the truth, people's sins are revealed. We do that in our own lives, don't we? If I know the truth and I'm doing something wrong, God's word convicts me of that sin. Paul says, you know, the rules were there. If God hadn't said, don't covet, it would be a sin to covet. But when you teach that that's wrong, the sins that you're doing are becoming revealed. They're coming out into the open. So that you know I'm not supposed to be doing this stuff. This isn't the message God wants me to bring out. And so the light will bring out God's kingdom. That's the primary purpose. But frequently they won't be interested in God's kingdom until they realize I got sin in my life and I need to get it out. How am I going to get that sin out of my life? And probably one of the things many of us in the church do poorly is to convince people that it's their sins that have separated them from the light. We sometimes like to skip over that part and say, you got a Savior that died for you, wants to take you to heaven. Okay, I'll take that. Without ever getting into, well, there's some lifestyle changes that are going to be required. That's the parable Jesus gives about the guy who's preparing for war. You consider who your enemies are, how big their army, because you don't go fighting them if you can't win. Uh, you instead, you sue for peace. You don't start building a tower you know, without making sure you've got enough lumber and boards and money to finish it. Otherwise, everybody looks at you and thinks, I don't know who you are, couldn't finish your house. We need to be telling people, not only do we have a Savior that wants to save you and who died to do that, but if you're going to follow him, you got some changes to make in your life. I don't think we do a good enough job of doing that, but if we're really shining the light on people, <coughs> their sins are revealed, and as the light shines on us, our sins are revealed. And we need to be recognizing if that's part of the problem that we live with is we've got sin in our lives. Jesus says this, talking about the sin, and I'll go back to that a little bit. He says, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees. That word yeast is used throughout the New Testament. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. In this case, what is yeast? Who cooks? It causes things to rise. Yeah, it causes stuff to rise. It permeates through the a whole little, thing. A little yeast in there corrects everything. That's exactly right. <laughs> And so Jesus said, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees, their hypocrisy. We've already talked about that a little bit. We're supposed to be Christians, and we're not living the way we're supposed to. 
says the time is coming when everything that is covered up will be revealed. In other words, these people who think they're the religious leaders, right? But when this is being said, it was Jews that he was talking to. Absolutely right. So it's not the Christians, it was the Jews. That is correct. He's, that is absolutely correct. He's talking to the Pharisees who were the religious leaders of the Jews. And he's saying these people are hypocrites. And you can read through the Gospels and see so many times where he tells you why. He says, the time's coming when everything that's covered up is going to be revealed. All that's secret will be made known. Whatever you've said in the dark will be heard in the light. Whatever you've whispered behind closed doors will be shouted from the housetops. For all to hear, we need to be not be living the way the Pharisees were, which was doing things to just give themselves credit. They liked to boast. They liked to have the high seats. They thought they were the mucky muck Christian people, well, not Jewish religious leaders. Jesus says, don't be like them. In another account, he says, do what they say, not what they do, because they weren't living what they were teaching. And so we need to be aware that it's easy for us as well not to be doing the things we're supposed to be doing and yet professing to be Christians. I'm going to challenge leaders if not read to let them go. That's right. Everyone on TV. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot of people in church buildings on Sunday morning that haven't paid much attention to this either. Uh, it's sometimes me as we watch the things we do that we shouldn't be doing or the things we should be doing that we don't do. You know, James says that's a sin too. The good that you know to do that you don't do, that's a sin too. You know, it's not good enough just to say, like the Pharisee did at the prayer story, I don't do this, I don't do that, I don't do this. You know, God says, yeah, but what are you doing? You know, what good are you doing? Uh, are you not letting your light shine? So we need to be real careful with that. So as God's lamp, you reveal truth. You reveal sin. A lamp, as a lamp, you have to receive in order to give, right? How did those lamps work back in those days? You had to fill them with oil. You had to fill them with oil. You could get all the wick you wanted and set them on fire. They're not going to burn very long. But if you fill that little bowl, that little basin or whatever little wick's in with some oil, and most of us have had oil lamps somewhere along the way in our lives. We understand that. And you've got to keep filling them up. As oil burns out, you've got to fill them up. So if we're going to be a light, we've got to be filled up. We've got to be constantly trying to learn more and more and living the way God wants us to live. Study the Bible. Read scriptures. Go to worship. Talk to your friends about Jesus. Anything that will fill you up, keep you filled so that your light continues to shine. Jesus says, if anyone has ears, let them hear. Consider carefully what you hear. How careful are we in hearing what we hear? How many of us listen to trash from time to time? Trash gossip. Yeah. Rumors. Yeah. Things we shouldn't be listening to. And who is listening to the news? Yep. Yeah, Sometimes just listening to the news is bad enough. Yeah. <laughs> Halftime show. Halftime show we watch. <laughs> At least what it was on. I, I didn't understand a word of it, so I wouldn't hear anything. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't understand, understand a word they were saying. But I Jesus says, carefully consider what you hear. We need to pay more attention to what we're hearing, what we allow to enter our ears, what we're listening to. This can work not only worldly things, but it can work with supposedly religious things. Well, it can influence you. That's absolutely right. Very easily. That's absolutely right. Carefully consider what you hear. Pay attention to what you hear. Don't just listen to everything you hear and accept it. Right? Don't just listen to somebody say, like Eric Rogers I mentioned Sunday morning, who doesn't believe in the God we believe in. Don't accept what he says and just accept it. Be careful. Carefully consider what you hear. Pay attention to what you're hearing and then consider what it is before you just say, yeah, that sounds good. Uh, give it some thought. Carefully consider what you hear. I told Debbie a joke the other day. Uh, I'll try it with you. You may have heard it already, so it won't work too well. It's, it's a math problem, okay? <laughs> Debbie loves my jokes. She, she's just always laughing. All right, this is a math story, but you can't use a pencil. All right? You're the conductor on a train that has 25 people on it. At the first stop, 10 people get off. Five people get on. At the next stop, eight people get on, three people get off. At the last stop, 15 people get off, 28 people get on. All right, you got all that figured out now? 
What's the name of the conductor? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what did Margaret get that? I think Margaret. Uh, it's all in the gray here, girl. <laughs> <laughs> What's the name? You. It's you are. Remember, we started it by saying it. you are. So it's your name. That's who you are. That's the way we don't listen. You know, we don't pay attention to what we're hearing. Carefully consider what you hear. Pay attention to what you hear. Yeah, most people made my granddaughters mad at me when I gave them. But you, you can even go to what you see as well. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's like the picture you put on there yesterday. What are you looking at? Yeah. We get so attracted by the bright lights and the cool stuff that we're not paying attention to what's going on around us. We're not paying attention to people's lives. We're not paying attention. That's, that's what Satan does. He distracts us because he doesn't want us doing the kind of things we should be doing. Luke says, therefore consider carefully how you listen. What's the difference in carefully consider what you hear and consider carefully how you listen. Well, sometimes you have a preconceived notion of what you want and if you can have somebody just tickle your ear a little bit, then all of a sudden you're, woo -hoo, I think that's exactly it. How are you listening? Am I listening so I can reinforce what I already believe or want, or want to believe? Am I listening to Mo because I like the way she talks, but I'm not going to listen to John because I don't like him anyway. You know, how am I listening to what people are saying? And I think all of us are guilty of listening to hear what we want to hear. And that's so true in religious settings because most of us were raised in church and we know what we've been taught our whole life. And if you're not willing to have ears to hear, we don't want to hear somebody say it's not the way I was raised. You know, this is the way I was brought up. This is the way it's going to be. You can tell me all the Bible you want to. I'm not going to hear it. I'm just not going to pay attention. How this is also what that you brought up Sunday is that why are celebrities that are not, that do nothing experts? Yeah. yeah. Why do I want to listen to some movie star, you know, who's reading scripts and making entertainment for me, and then they go out and pontificate over all kinds of crazy ideas, and everybody listens to them. Everybody thinks they know what they're talking about. Aaron Rodgers. Like Aaron Rodgers. Well, they, you know, they, they all have a huge following. They have a huge following. Yeah. And people it, accept, it, they're not listening to the truth. They're just listening to them because he's somebody important. I'm going to wait until someone moves to Canada. That's exactly um, yeah. They haven't yet. <laughs> yeah. They haven't yet. Yeah. So, Nobody okay. goes back home where they came from, no matter what happens. <laughs> Everybody's getting ready. I got that. <laughs> Here's what Jesus says in response to that whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have even what they think they have will be taken from them. How does that fit into this parable? This is probably the toughest part of these, the Mark and Luke parables, is what Jesus says. Whoever has will get more. Whoever doesn't have even what they have will be they, taken away. They get to, to look at it in the light of the life. Yes. Yeah, look whoever at has the light, he's yes. given more. Absolutely. Whoever doesn't, or even the ones that think they have it, but they don't, all of them, they can. I mean, whoever has the them. light needs to spread the light. Yes. Needs to, yeah. they, they need, like you said, they need it. People need to know that they're glorifying God. Yes. Not hiding. Yeah. So just because you have the light, you got to do something with that light. You got to do something with it. Otherwise, you're like salt. It's lost its saltiness. And the only value has to be thrown out on the If you put it in context, the Jews were not accepting what Christ was teaching. That's exactly correct. As he looks at the Jews, especially the Pharisees, if you take the light in, if you're really listening to Jesus, you are going to get more and more. Haven't we all found that to be true? The more you want to learn the Bible, the more you learn the Bible. If you put yourself to it, if you apply yourself and you study and you learn and you pray about it, ask God's Spirit to enlighten you. There's that word that the more you do that, the more light you get. But if you think you've already got it, notice that's what he said. If you think you've already arrived, you know, even Paul says, I don't consider myself to have arrived. I've still got a long way to go. Here's this great apostle, Paul, who says, I haven't got there yet. I'm still struggling day by day. I love this passage. I buffet my body. Right? It's buffet his body, but it's buffet to me because I like to eat. So I take that that verse, and so he's talking about food. 
But Paul says we're all striving to get better. And the more light you have, the more you want the light, and the more God will give it to you if you keep yearning for it. But if you think you've already arrived, like the Pharisees did, we're the cream of the crop, we're the religious leaders, Jesus says, you know, what you think you've got, I'm even taking that away from you. You don't have a clue. And then it's just, that's the key, I think, to this parable. You're, that's one of the Beatitudes, right? Hunger and thirst after righteousness because you'll be feeling it. That's what he's saying here. If you will use the light, seek out the light, hunger for the light, you'll get more and more and more light. But if you don't, even what you have is going to be taken away because you lose your saltiness. You have no worth. That's a challenging verse to me. should be for all of us. Am I spending enough time studying the Bible? Am I spending enough time in prayer? Am I spending enough time talking to people about God? Am I trying to get more and more light in my body or am I just content to be blind? It it's right here. it's so like if you're content with a 60 watt or do you want a 100 watt? Yeah, because Jesus no, said if you're content with the 60 watt, well, well, you want it to grow and I mean, grow and grow. But if you're content with the 60 watt, Jesus is saying, I'm going to shut the fire off to you. If you're not willing to grow and learn and get more and more light, I think Jesus is saying, that thing you think you've got, you're going to lose it. It isn't going to last. Challenging passage. We'll finish this up next week and move on to the next ones in that list of things. So it would be numbers three or four, whatever is in between the two light ones. We'll do those. Okay. Last comments, thoughts, anybody? I know every time I read the Bible, so, you know, as soon as I finish it, I start again, that whatever book I'm on, something will pop out of me that I didn't understand the, the last time I read it. Right. The last, or the time yeah. before that. So that That's exactly what I'm saying. You right. Know, you're getting so more like, and more How come I didn't get that last time? Yeah. I mean, like, I mean, it's like vivid. Like, yeah. You know, but like, like, yeah. Well, but I didn't get it last time. That's like know? this parable. I don't know that I've ever got it this way. That Jesus is saying, if you're hungering and thirsting for righteousness, you're going to get more and more and more light. But if you're not, if you don't want it, then what little you think you've already got, I'm taking it away from you. You won't even have that. It's a scary thought. And again, I think it ties to the salty one that we sort of skip over a lot. And honestly, you should never have, like you said about Paul, you should never, like, I'll die before I have all the, <coughs> the knowledge and the light. I mean, there's just so we much. There's yeah, no yeah, way we're going to learn You just have to keep yeah. You just keep trying. Yeah. You just keep trying. And the neat thing is God loves us. And he wants us to succeed. And so if we try, he gives us the power to do it. That's close. God, thank you for today. Thank you for revealing your light to us. And I pray that, Father, as we study tonight, that we will want to let our lights shine. That we will show people you in the way that we live, the way that we act, the way that we talk. So that others can come to know the joy that we have. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all. Thank you.